Welcome to the Bridge to You podcast, hosted by yours truly, Monique Russell, where we focus on promoting Black unity worldwide through conversations that help us understand ourselves and each other. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Bridge to You podcast. I'm your host, Monique Russell. And today, oh my goodness, where do I even begin? If I were to describe her energy and her passion and her presence and her impact, I literally would run out of words. I mean, she is the former Miss Jamaica 2005 master event host and planner, positive media personality, champion for women's girls' rights, gender equality, the host of the Redirection podcast, where guests who have been rejected turn their failures into opportunities. She's literally known as the human ethernet and describes herself as the connector of people. Please, Dr. Terry Carell Reed, it is a pleasure to have you on the show today. Hi, Mo- listen, hi, Mo- first of all, after an introduction like that, I just want to drop my mic and be like, this has been fun. Thank you so very much. <laughs> and go. That was amazing. Thank you. You are so welcome. So Dr. Terry Carell, every time I have people on the show, my guests, you, they- you know, you better call me Terry Carell. Why are you calling me doctor? You know, you better call me Terry Carell. I'm Stop sorry. <laughs> Okay, Terry. (laughs) Terry Carell, you have been on like, I know, 10 plus continents all around the world. And I always like to ask the guests, if you could choose anywhere that you would want to be in the world right now, where would you choose and why? Oh my goodness. That's a fantastic. I haven't gotten that question since 2005 for Miss Jamaica World, actually. Really? one One of my judges for the pre judging asked me that very question and I said Vanuatu and I remember this awkward pause and he tilted his head and then he said where and I said Vanuatu and he said I've never heard of that of that country ever and um, I think that's why I want to go there I am a lover of places that are underdeveloped you know, the ones that still preserve nature and they're still very respectful of conservation. And um, that is the place I would love to love to visit. In Cuba, I actually ended up meeting someone who is actually a native of Vanuatu. And I said, I have to go there before I die. Vanuatu. Vanuatu. They have their own tribal language, what? very peaceful people, loving people. And I just said, you know, I know a lot of persons like to do the whole Maldives and Bali and all of those places that are beautiful but certainly luxurious and I'm like no I want to do it like real deal Vanuatu style you know what okay so first of all you are already blowing my mind away because you're the first person I have ever heard of Vanuatu okay and everybody else really will talk about Bali and Australia and all these other things so you are already my mind is already exploding I really want to dive deep like tell me about these people and their language and their culture and all of this stuff like how did you know about how did you get to know about this place um you know what I think I have to give God thanks for my grandma eh my grandmother while I was growing she was the matriarch she always told me that uh, we are more than what we see you know we're, we're not just Jamaicans in Jamaica and the world what revolves around us but that it was important to understand people, their cultures, their backgrounds, their customs, so that when you meet them, you will know what to say and and how to say it and just to be mindful. I think she was the one who drilled that. And so for me, I was always looking at the Atlas, always looking at places to go. And at first you start off with the big ones that everybody talks about, you're Australia, I wanna go here. And And as I got older, I got more picky. And I think when I went and I met by Zoom, Kamaraga Fago, which is his last name, try spelling that last name. <laughs> what? And Kamaraga was, who? Kamaraga Fago, can I tell you? And um, he was from Vanuatu. And I said, tell me about Vanuatu and how he described it. And I did my research and I just saw him being the perfect ambassador. I said, you know what? 
that's where I really want to go. Mm. You know what I love so much about this is because you also talked about the language, the tribal language, per- preserving their culture. And you know, this podcast is all about Black unity. It's a Black, yes. black love, Black solidarity. And I think sometimes we, we forget about that because we haven't been able to preserve that culture Mm-hmm. pre-colonial uh, culture yes. um, but you mentioned about language and and how that language just allows you to sort of connect when you went to Cuba Hi-yi-yi. you you <laughs> went you went to Cuba and you you adopted the language you picked up the language how did that change your level of connection with the people once you, you started know- to connect that way Beautiful question. Um, And you know what? Uh, It's something that I think is one of the nicest things I did or one of my biggest accomplishments. Sure, there are people who speak nine, 10 languages as polyglots, but um, it's one of my favorite uh, quotes, you know, that says, if you speak to a man in a language he understands, you know, you speak to his head. But if you speak to a man in his language, you speak to his heart. And I think I was always a great communicator always a good team leader and team player I was always the girl and the person across school who could get everybody together it didn't matter who wasn't talking or who wasn't a part of the group I was always able to be the glue Mm -hmm. and so when I got to Cuba and this was a matter of you know it's either do or die you either learned the language because your career was in that language or you had to go home But what you realize is that when you want to connect with people, you can't force them to learn your language, which is what a lot of English speakers do. I think that's one of our biggest downfalls because we recognize and we acknowledge that we are the universal language. And because we know that the world caters to us, we are entitled. And I think learning a language not only humbles you, but it allows you to engage in a deeper, more meaningful language. It says that I submit to you. I am willing to make mistakes. I'm willing to sound stupid, but I will do this to talk to you in a language that speaks to your heart. And so, oh, girl, I get in a breach. I get in a breach. <laughs> I'm feeling it over here, Terry. I'm feeling it. Continue. Yeah. Right. So when I meet a Cuban now, I could say hi. And of course they would say hi back. But when I say, oh yeah, I said, it's like, whoa, family. Mm. They now recognize you as one of ours. They recognize you as family. And everyone knows that when you speak in a language that speaks to people's heart, they open their doors and they cater to you. Mm. And that's one of the nicest things that has happened for me being bilingual. Wow. I love this because like I tell you, I almost was supposed to pass the offering plate through the, through, through the zoom screen, because that was so powerful, the way we are able to surrender ourselves to get to know each other. And I think even like you talked about this family connection, even within the Caribbean and the Caribbean region, we are family, but sometimes it doesn't feel like that even though we are speaking that same language. Mm-hmm. So I, I am really curious about this. Like if I think about other African countries, um, learning their language so that we can have a deeper connection, oh, my. How, can we, how can we now use language? What would you say about using language within the Caribbean region um, as a tool to foster connection? Oh my goodness. I think it's something that is absolutely uh, missing, you know, and, and, and what is even more interesting is in school. And I think it's probably the same for, for you guys as well, but in school, we are given the option of French or Spanish, but mostly you're pushed in Spanish direction. Um, And even when it comes to our own language, our own patois, you know, it's frowned upon, Mm -hmm. you know, the part of us that actually differentiates us from the rest of the world and is something that is revered in songs and, you know, all over the world here, it is frowned upon in certain spaces, you know, it's just not right to speak your patois. But back to my point, we are taught to learn, you know, Spanish or French. And yet still, when I went to Cuba and I'm now dorming with over 40 nationalities and I hear the Lucians come in, you know, with their, you know, their Isa, and they're saying all of these different things. I'm saying, but it's so rich within the islands itself, but yet still, I don't have a clue about Mm. the Dominicans. I don't have a clue about 
the Lucians um, and the Vinces. And if, if I were not given that opportunity in Cuba, I wouldn't have known it. But for those of us who integrated, again, what you start to realize is that it's no longer a Jamaican versus a Lucian. It's just, what, it's just we, Caribbean, mm. how we can collaborate, how we can collaborate in a deeper way. And I think if we thought about each other more, and again, with intention, I think we could be bridging a lot, a lot of gaps if we stop treating um, our region as, as just individuals. When you really think about it, we only acknowledge the region when we go Olympics and we root for each other because it is the one thing that unifies us as a region. But outside of that, I don't think we're using language enough to bridge the, the gaps and the voids that, that currently exist between our countries. Wow. Wow. Okay. So I didn't even think about using language as a tool to bridge within the countries because I think, you know, most people, we speak English, but with even within that, you have the different dialects um, within the region. So, I mean, there was something that you said when you say it's no longer about the individual, um, you know, Jamaican versus the Lucian and, um, you know, whatever other nationality nationalities within the Caribbean, it is about the Caribbean. It's about the region using that language. So part of me is I'm thinking about what possibly could be something that unifies in the same way that the Olympic unifies hmm. us is as a region. That's one thing that I'm, I want to explore. It may come up later. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I want to explore is yes, you know, the reality is there's so much of that, okay, Jamaican versus the Haitian versus the Lucian versus the, you know, Bahamian and the Trinidadian is the best and all of this, all of this other stuff. So what contributed to you thinking this way? Because traditionally it's not the norm. It's <laughs> not the norm. <laughs> what we influenced this? We compare. Yeah, yes, sure. yes, yes. I think I think apart I think apart from the fact that my mom and my grandma, if I can really say so, did a fantastic job with me, if I may say so, they helped to shape and mold um, how I viewed the world and how I viewed people. And I think for for my grandmother, it was always to remind me that listen, no man is an island. That's number one. Um, and even though you may love the persons around you and people who are like-minded and they look like you and they sound like you, that's great, but it's limiting. Let's mm. be real. We're limited because we are accustomed to our culture and we're accustomed to looking at things with our perspective to a certain lens. But how rich does that lens become when you start to now interact with other people who start to show you and introduce you and expose you to other things that now makes life and meaning and purpose so much bigger than what you anticipated. And so for me, whenever I met persons, it never mattered to me if you're rich or if you're poor or if you're black or if you're brown. It was, wow, I can't wait to unpack what you're going to teach me and what I'm going to exchange with you. I think that is how... I've grown and it has only been something that has increased as I've gotten older. Mm. So for the guests that are listening, I hope you guys caught that. But, you know, <laughs> Terry was exposed to a different way of seeing the world, even growing up in the Caribbean. Like, you know what? Don't limit yourself just to who we are in our own country as a people. But how much more rich and engaging can your relationships be? And don't forget, pull out your atlas because listen, Terry said from, from she was small, the atlas was something that she was exposed to. Now, Terry, you say you, does, you really don't care if they're black or brown. So now that we talk about black or brown, let's talk about light skin. Let's oh, talk Lord. about coolie. Let's oh. talk about, <laughs> let's talk Girl. about, let's talk about <laughs> colorism because yes, I, I learned um, in preparing for your interview that when you were in Cuba, you identified yourself as black negra. Oh, yeah. But, and for people who, who don't understand or know what colorism is, is really the idea that your skin tone, if your skin tone is lighter, you're more superior or you're more beautiful or you're more brilliant. That's what it means. Terry and I don't believe that. Y'all know we don't believe that. Please. But that's, that's, what, that's what the idea is. But Terry, you identified yourself as Negra and they said, no, you were not. How did you process? Tell us about this experience and how you processed it. 
I, I think it was the most confusing thing to me because I've grown up in a country that is predominantly black. I am black. And even if you put me up against a girl who we consider to be browning, I consider myself to be black. So naturally we get over to Cuba, you know, you're, meet, you're meeting people, you're making a lot of friends and the more you become Cuban, no? Porque yo hablo así, yo hablo como cubano. So the, the more you interact with them and the more they acknowledge you is the, the more honest they are with you. Mm -hmm. And so I remember when I identified and I said, yo soy negra and they looked offended and they said, no, 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 no. They made it very clear that I am what they call a mestizo. You know, I am mixed. And I said, no, I'm a, ne I'm a, I'm a Negro. I'm a, I'm a Black girl. And they made it very clear that because in their eyes, I am beautiful. Mm. I am attractive. I have a different texture in my hair. As far as their concern in their country, Negra is ugly or negra is dumb, you know, maybe not the smartest tool in the shed. And because I had all of these positive attributes, there's no way I should be identifying as a negra. And well, you know me, you know my personality. Until I left Cuba, I identified as a negra. negra. Yo wow. soy negra. So see, I mean, again, we now coming back to this language aspect because the way that black is defined in a language tells a lot about how we show up and connect with that person. It was almost like there was this resistance to you adopting this term because how could you? Absolutely. I, I did a podcast a couple um, episodes back with a gentleman out of Ghana and he, he had his experience in China. And when he studied the language of what it meant to be African. It meant yes. dirty. It meant wow. dark. It meant yes. ugly. And so this, this aspect of language and, and your multilingual experiences coming out, I feel like this is a really strong point for us and for us as, as people to start to look at exploring and, and going deeper into language and the meaning of what Black is in the languages that we are trying to connect with. Absolutely. And you see, and in addition to that, even before I travel, um, you know, I know the in Instagram and social media has has truly glamorized travel. And a lot of us look to find these places that we can take the, the nicest pictures to get the most likes or, or engagement on our pages. But even when it comes to travel, I always do research, not just on the weather, but clothing, you know, mm. dress, um, color. How do these people view um, citizens of my country. Like these are things that I research because I think that language isn't just verbal, it is nonverbal communication as well. And so you want to always make sure that when you come in the presence of other people, that you are mindful of what a color in my culture may be may mean mourning and in somebody else's color, country, it means celebration. You know, what does that nonverbal communication look like? And I think Again, you have to step out of yourself and what you're accustomed to and what you want for yourself and be open to what other persons um, consider normal as well. Mm. So if you find that the, the nonverbal language in a culture, like what, what will tell you, no, I'm not going to visit this place in your research as you're preparing, what would be some signs that mm, maybe I don't want to go this place? Right. So if I, if I, if I research a country that I might really want to go to, and when I do my social media monitoring, or we say social listening across the board, and you start to see reviews, I, I love reviews, and you start to see people, especially if you are seeing women of color, you know, saying, hey, they didn't have a great experience in this particular country, or they found that women, maybe didn't have a thing to do with color, but women in particular were treated like, you know, second-class citizens, mm -hmm. best believe that's, that's scratched off my list. I'm not, I'm not interested in that at all. Wow. So I generally stay away from countries that do not respect people of color. And especially if I happen to be a woman of color, anything that goes against my, my, my rights, um, mm. I'm not visiting that country. I'm not welcomed. So I don't have to go there. Wow. That's a mouthful. I mean, I hope everyone <laughs> listening to this is like, you know, we, we are in such a serious time right now, 2021, mm -hmm. the decade of the 21st century, where really and truthfully gone are the days where you can 
be discriminating or discriminatory against others and it won't impact your country or impact your mm. brand or impact your future, quite frankly, because mm. things reside on the internet forever and ever. Um, Terry, this is incredible. I just feel like, you know, you just have so much uh, breath and depth into this, into this topic. I want to just uh, pause here for a moment and ask you, based on what we've talked about so far, what do you want to share with our listeners? Just whatever is coming up for you um, in terms of this topic or any others connected to it, what would you like to share? Um, you know, I think that we've come a far way, honestly, but I think we have so much more work to do on ourselves and, and, and on others. And I think part of the reason why maybe we treat each other as, as competitors and we, we don't look to collaborate as much is because of what we've experienced, right? 400 years ago, yeah. it has been handed down. We've been taught to go up against each other. And that is not something that we can quickly get over, but I still think it can be done. And it starts with intention. It's a word that we use, but I think it's extremely important. Mm -hmm. So it starts with you. It starts with me. It starts with these conversations, but we have to be doers. We can talk about this all we want, but if we're not trying to share this um, with our children, who are not just the future generation, but the present, then really we'll just be continuing to talk about this ad nauseum. And so I think, I think um, as much as we've come a far way, uh, I think there's a lot of growing up and maturity that we need to do within ourselves. You know, our black men out there, you know, we hear your comments when you speak about beauty. You know, parents out there, we hear your comments when you push your sons to marry or have children with brown skinned girls, because in your opinion, that's what's gonna lighten the, the, the color and the, the pedigree, you know, in your family. What that does is it perpetuates the idea that black is not good enough. Mm -hmm. And yes. so as, as much as we go out of our ways to get the, in, the, um, the academics and we get the ones in CXC and we try to get the job and we get all of this and we are not putting the same effort in ensuring that our language that we use with people is mindful that we are trying to have meaningful relationships without exploiting people, that we are valuing people based on what they bring to the table and not by the color of their skin or their gender. And if we are not intentionally trying to do that, then we are as complicit as anti-Blacks. Wow, wow. Oh my gosh, ouch. That one is, <laughs> it is so true. That one is so, so, so true. You know, the thing is, hi, yeah, 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 yeah. Monique is like, I don't even know. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to tell you because it's almost like we have this awareness. And, but like you say, that, that knowledge is not enough. So we have to be doers. We have to take the action. We have to share the stories. And then if we have these, um, pre-defined meaning of what it means to be black, we have to now begin to redefine, you know, redefine what that means to be black. And it's not so much about black as a color, but black as an identity, ah, you, you know? the nail on the head, which means that now in our schools, we need to be more intentional about the books that we have our children read from a literature standpoint. It now means that we need to start writing more books about our history where, where the narrative is not we were slaves yes. or that we were born slaves. We were kings and queens. What we, do you mean? We, we were, we were, we were. What do you mean? We, we were. were taken from the individual yes. respective places that we were. And we were made to be slaves. And so I think it is important for us now to, as you say, redefine. But how we do that is getting historians and getting our, our creatives, our writers to now tell stories in a way that makes us go, wow, that was us. Because then now we define not just the color, we redefine the definition of Black. But more importantly, the Caribbean. 
Yes. You know something. So I I love what you say because I have been on this journey of um going into like more history, his pre pre slavery history. And I tell you the things that I find and the things that I read when I read them, it just does something to your psyche when you know your origin, when you know your story. And I remember when my my kids were younger and I would bring in different coloring books and I would bring in, you know, black black the black Jesus stories and things right. like that. And I said, you know, at the end of the day, if if we are going to be exposed to brainwashing, I want the brainwashing to, I want me to be the one to brainwash my kids and myself before anybody else brainwashes Absolutely. me. Absolutely. The favor has to be ours. And so I think that's also another part. We can't be exposed if we're not willing to deep dive mm. and to read and to research and find out that a lot of the persons who we think invented things were actually not the right people. They were black people. So I think we also need to be um, held. We need to hold ourselves accountable. We are responsible for our knowledge and therefore we need to seek um, more wisdom, not just knowledge, but mm. wisdom, which is something that is completely different from, from knowledge in my opinion. Wow. Listeners, I hope you guys heard that. Terry gave us a whole bunch of nuggets today. <laughs> first of all, you all need to get on a flight to Vanuatu. Number one, that's the first tip. Number two is the tribal language. And I really want to uh, take this as an action item for anyone listening. Go and explore other tribal languages, any other tribal language, Black historic uh, tribal language. There is hundreds in the continent of Africa. There are hundreds within and throughout the Caribbean. Begin and pick one. And I think that if we were to actually have these languages in our school system, as opposed mm. to just French and Spanish, this could be a way to begin expanding that love, that unity and that connection. And among business. Oh, and yeah. and business. Business. business opportunities open up when you speak the language and you oh, understand the culture for sure. This is it. This is it. Then I also love that you said, you know what? We are more than what we see. Your grandmother gave you this beautiful quote, beautiful saying, we're more than what we see. Learning that language allows us to speak to others' heart. And you heard Terry just now say, do business. I mean, you really want to be able to do business and connect and liberate yourself um, and take yourself to another economic level. Mm -hmm. Think about it that way. I'm not just learning my language because sometimes people got to know where the money at, where the money <laughs> reside. So if you want to make more money, pick a language that you want to learn to do business, to expose and expand yourself to more economic prosperity. Um, the other thing that you said was we need to learn how to collaborate in a deeper way. Again, bringing this back to language, get out of your box. Don't be thinking just about black as a color, but really black is an identity. And it may have been said that black was not good enough. You may have felt like it was not good enough. You may have been conditioned with this colorism view, but when you are able to redefine what black means to you, and I'll put this in the show note, how do you redefine what black means to you? Then we can begin to have a deeper connection. Terry, if our audience listeners want to connect with you, which yes. they should, oh, please let us know where they can find you. Uh, they can find me at Terry Carell across all of my platforms. Um, definitely my community, my huge community is on Instagram, but you know, you will see me on LinkedIn, which is where we met. So I'm always willing and, and happy to, to welcome anyone who wants to be a part of my community. And certainly if they, you know, anyone who might've been listening, who has been hurt by words um, mm. with relation to their color, especially as women, you know, what I will start is what I'll tell you is, you know, never be content with someone else's definition of you. In fact, you know, we no longer seek validation. You know, if someone wants to, to, to look at you or demean and diminish and denigrate you because of their ignorance, well, that's their problem, not yours. Yeah. And, and the reason why this topic of, of color and especially as a, a black woman is, is very important to me and why, for example, even in Cuba around persons who are telling me, no, you are not black. I'm able to stand in my um, affirmation and say I am. When I entered Mr. Maker World in 2005, I was an unlikely candidate. I was a tomboy. 
Um, but I entered with an Afro. That's how I always wore my hair. And we had a month to practice. And as we're getting closer to the coronation, more people started coming to me and saying, hey, you know, we don't think the whole Afro thing is going to work. You know, um, a, a woman actually told my mother when we had a we had a public gathering, you know, a public show. And she asked my mom, is that your daughter? My mom said, yeah. She said, nice girl, nice package. She seems bubbly and, you know, great. But, you know, she can't win. Those were her words. And my mother was like, what? And she said, come on, look at her hair. And look at the women who've won this competition traditionally. That ain't it. And so, you know, although there were people rooting for me, a lot of them were saying, boy, you know, she's not going to get it because she's just too black. Wow. She's too proud. So there are people who wanted me to win, but they said the judges are not going to give her because she's too unapologetically black. And then there were those who said you cannot win because you can't be black with an Afro. You have to pick your struggle. Wow. Remember the, the, yeah. So the night before the finals, we go to our hair sponsors and they, they, they are basically going to do your hair in a manner that you believe will give you the competitive advantage. Girls, color, cut, straighten, whatever. And guess who they left for last? Moi. So I'm sitting down at the conference table. All the girls have left. It's now 7 p.m., I think. And the technicians go, so what are we going to do with your hair? And I said, well, we're going to wash it. We're going to condition it. And we're going to keep this party moving because I ain't doing nothing. And so on the finals, I show up with my Afro because that is how I come. I, this is how I roll. So I win talent. I win most aware and I win most congenial. And I tell myself, well, I've done enough. When I win, it was a new dawning. I remember it. I get goosebumps just like it was last, like last week mm. where my face was splashed all over the newspaper. It was a big deal because here it is. There was this black girl with this Afro. Afro. There were school girls who were now wearing their hair in puffs. And even though I won nationally, people came back to me and said, well, Terry Carell, how are you going to manage when you go foreign to Miss World with the Venezuela and the Costa Rica? And I said, what do you mean? They said, what are you going to do with your hair? I said, baby love, we're going to wash it. We're going to condition, <laughs> condition it. it. And we're going to keep it moving. And I would end up being the um, Caribbean's, uh, Caribbean's um, first choice. And I ended up placing in the top 15 with my wow. Afro. And so I share this story to say that not everyone is going to like what you may look like. But again, that is not your problem. Mm -hmm. That's their demons that they need to confront, not you. And I'm happy that that happened to me and that I can use myself as an example of truly believing in your power and standing in it. Wow. And your mom had to support that because imagine now if your mom was conceding, like, no, Terry, get, Terry got to do something with her hair. She got to straighten it. She got to perm it down or whatever. You know, because some parents do that to their kids, even wow. if they want to be uh, uh, who they are, express themselves. They're like their, their own insecurities in, in, influence their kids. Too. No, she was like, baby girl, she's like, you, you got this. Go do your thing. What makes you happy? Stay true to yourself. And that's all I've ever done. And I'm happy that those things had to happen for mm -hmm. me to truly realize that I have the power to resist anyone who chooses to tell me I am not enough. I will show you that I am more than enough. In fact, I will blow your mind and you will have to just humble yourself and say, yo, enough respect. Yo, she said, <laughs> <laughs> she said, humble yourself. Humble yourself. <laughs> I yeah. love it. I love it. Terry, listen, I need to put you in a bottle and <laughs> just keep you in my purse. And every time I need to channel my inner Terry, <laughs> open that bottle and humble yourself. Okay. You humble guys yourself. say it foolishness Thank to you. me, humble yourself. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Thank you for having me. And of course, love to all of your listeners. Thank you, Dr. Terry Carell. Guys, give us a five-star rating. Leave a comment. Let us know how <laughs> this episode impacted you. And of course, until next time, take care and be well. Thanks for listening to the Bridge to You podcast. Visit clairecommunicationsolutions.com or connect with me on LinkedIn, Monique Russell, or Instagram at Clear Communication Coach.